Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from five exciting countries across Europe. I am joined here today by Alessio. Hi. The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from five exciting countries across Europe. I am joined here today by Alessio. Hi. Audrey. Hello, everyone. Cara. Hello. David. Hey. And I'm your host, Fen. We're going to be talking about a bunch of different board games in the hobby. And we're going to be talking about a bunch of different board games in the hobby. And we'll start, as we always do, with the standee catch-up. So I'm going to jump in first, just to say, um, uh, well, apart from the joy of it raining here, which has been great because it's been very dry. Um, I've been mostly catching up with the games playing when I talked about in the last podcast. So I've played the network solo. I can say it's really good. Like, very solid, great solo game. Uh, I have played some Destiny solo. It is better as a solo experience. Doesn't feel as bad. And it's got some nice replayability. You can play each scenario about six times if you want. Different sides. Um, and I've also been playing Imperium... Um, Legends and Classics. Uh, may talk about those in the future. I did want to briefly say that it is absolutely fantastic the depiction of the Arthurian legend in Imperium Legends. Uh, somebody's finally got it giving the characters their proper names which are Welsh. It's been fantastic. Like I've been so fed up with uh, the way people have pilfered um, Welsh heritage and used it for their own and to actually finally see a game that turns around and, and uh, just like plays it as as it should be um um so it scored big points in my book from that that sounds very thoughtful of you yeah uh, well if just that and the celts those are the two cultures i know the most about and those two i felt were really well represented so i can only assume the others are as well because uh nigel buckle um and this i apologize i think i've completely mispronounced his name both sections of it um have obviously done their research and spent a long time trying to create a fair and like culturally relevant and matching depiction of each civilization. Civilization, um, even though everybody on the box looks as dour and as sad as heck. Which <laughs> <laughs> these are, these are it's beautiful artwork, but I don't know why everyone looks like they've uh, swallowed a vial of poison and are regretting it. Um, and the last thing is I've uh, been. Um, and the last thing is I've uh, been, be, been enjoying this latest piece of drama that's unfolded on Board Game Geek, which is that terraforming Mars Ares, uh, due to their decision to release the game to Target, so it hit retail before it got to Kickstarter back. Game to Target, so it hit retail before it got to Kickstarter backers. Um, and the fact that some people feel that it's just a rip-off of Race for the Galaxy, but not as good, has resulted in it having about a 5 or 6 out of 10 rating. Um, considering that, like, Ooh. yeah, I know, considering that this is... Um, considering that, like, Ooh. yeah, I know, considering that this is a, ga a game from Stronghold Games, it's Terraforming Mars... It should be a hit because it's a tableau builder in card form. Um, they've really mismanaged this, and um, it's resulted in people discussing what rating systems should be used. Systems should be used for. Uh, ultimately, uh, Board Game Geek says you should use them for what you, uh, how much you want to play the game. So if the games really upset you, you might not want to play it, and you might want to rate it a one, two, or a three. Um, I think that's all sort of personal. Um, it's rare we see this level of... Uh, sh they should have their ratings locked for a, a certain amount of time before you can even start rating them after their release. I think it's crazy that people can uh, rate a board game as soon as it gets entered into the database. You know, it's like, oh, I'm back in this Kickstarter game, so I'm going to rate it 10 out of 10, because if it's not a 10 out of 10 game, then I'm a fool for having <laughs> bought it. I think that the the, ra the ratio... that Actually, how they justify this is... Just that uh, the statistics will eventually be true because so many people will be voting. Yeah, it, it eventually all averages out. And when you look at the like top section, um, it is a fairly game previously that uh, that got 
review bombed as well for different reasons. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's a bad time for terraforming Mars because if I'm not mistaken, it's for the big box of terraforming Mars that there was a controversy with the metallic cubes packaged one by one in little plastic bags. Cubes packaged one by one in little plastic bags. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's, it, it's the same franchise. Okay, I wasn't wrong. You, you're absolutely what? right. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, they, 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 nothing they could do about it. But yeah, the manufacturer decided that every single cube should be separately bagged in a piece of plastic because they would chip and scratch. Cubes should be separately bagged in a piece of plastic because they would chip and scratch if they were put together. Which you know is true, but that's not what people want in this day and age. We're asking for less plastic in our games and not to have to open. A hundred little baggies. I mean, they get thrown together anyway. I mean, they get thrown together anyway. You, you will put them all in the box and not have an insert with <laughs> recesses for every single cube. Yeah, they could have created a, a, a well where which was dimensionally set that all the cubes would fit in in a cube and stack properly. All the cubes would fit in in a cube and stack properly. Uh, and maybe even just baggy all of that cube in one vacuum sealed bag or something if they wanted to do that. But yeah, it's it wasn't really Stronghold Games' fault on that front. Um, but yeah, they are they're zero for two on that. So uh, I wait to see them strike out and whatever they do next. Um, yeah, okay, uh, Kara, what have you been up to? Um, well, always whenever you ask me, I feel like I should tell amazing stories about board games but right now i'm yes you should <laughs> hey, you could tell an amazing story about a cat if you wanted we'd all be thrilled i get to play a lot right now um but we do have a cat near our school and i got to pet it a few times during class you know i opened the door <laughs> towards the back and while the students were busy i um, <clears throat> got to pet the cat that was sitting outside that was nice. Um, the thrilling story of cat espionage. When no one's looking, I'm just going to pet this cat. <laughs> yeah, apart from that, I uh, got to play uh, Tsukuyumi um, last night. And um, three players. And for those who don't know, they are currently developing a new expansion. And it's really interesting. A new expansion. And it's really interesting to see how difficult it is in complex board games to like keep wording straight when you introduce new mechanics and uh, new options and but you have a set um, amount of cards and but you have a set um, amount of cards and wordings from your old releases so you have really have to look okay how does it work now <laughs> that was yeah. interesting the backward compatibility the backward compatibility conundrum yeah for example i had a faction where i had an effect with um regarding cards that my enemies could play once per turn however newer factions suddenly have cards in. and now we stood there and we're like okay does it affect those cards as well <laughs> Um, <clears throat> yeah. This this game um, landed in my uh, my local local retailer recently, and I was staring at it mostly because of the Lords of the Lost Sea. I think it is. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> but uh, I I just got completely lost because they've parcelled up everything that's received into all these tiny little um, packages on their sh site, and there's no hey, do you want everything that was in the Kickstarter, which they normally do, just buy this. So. Um, and also, I've got enough models, and I kind of... I, but uh, it's a really interesting looking game. I have the Sandee version, and I'm totally fine with it. Yeah, I, I can't help myself. I'm staring at uh, my complete... Pile it's shame. a life choice. Yeah, it's a style. Yeah. You could always, you know, do the, the stone effect spray job, you know? Uh, yeah. It's pretty simple. <laughs> it looks nice. Or, or uh, an, an azimuth priming. Mm. Yeah, and a zenithal priming. A few washes, paint some cracks on. Um, You know, just off you go. 
classic. Yeah, I, I, I can't force myself to do that. I, I don't like the stone look. It's okay for chess pieces and stuff like that, but for actual miniatures with detail, it seems like a crime to me. What are miniatures if not just fancy chess pieces? <laughs> It seems like a crime to me. What are miniatures if not just fancy chess pieces? <laughs> uh, actually, it is, but when you start customizing armor and weapons, uh, for example, uh, that's uh, um, customized chess pieces with a lot of custom example, uh, that's uh, um, customized chess pieces with a lot of customization. They deserve better than just the stone tint. <laughs> I I disagree. I've reduced many of mine down to sprues again by selling off my painted models, and I've got no inclination <laughs> to assemble them again right now. <laughs> the, the, that's a way to play this. Okay, who wants to go next? Me. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, since I wasn't there last episode, I have stuff to talk about. Go ahead. Uh, so with my boyfriend, we are making progress through playthrough. So I, we've reached uh, September, if I'm not wrong. So we failed it the first time. We we did just one mission, so uh, we are going to start it again uh, with a bit more cards and the two remaining missions. One of them as an alien is the same. Uh, we are really liking the, the game, honestly. The, the different uh, changes in gameplay are very fun. So I, I just can't wait to, to progress and uh, and finish it. I mean, uh, I, sc I scandalize the few communities where I share pictures of... Um, Oh, I gotta say, I'm having. We've been having a similar experience in how much we've enjoyed it, compared to Pandemic Legacy Season One, where we actually stopped playing when it was the the reveal of what the virus was about made us all groan and be like, right, well, we're not interested anymore. This one has been gripping. <laughs> yeah, and I know that I will probably trash everything once we are done. Maybe just keep the box as a decoration. But that's how you play a legacy game. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with uh, consumable board games as entertainment, especially if you think about it, it's what, like a couple of movies, but you get way more playtime. Yeah, then Heritage uh, Legacy board game, and this one has a refill pack, so I think it's something around 15 euros, and you can rebuild your game back, and I think that's another policy which is... Uh, pretty interesting, but it works mostly because you don't modify everything in the game. While in Pandemic, you do modify just... I mean, uh, uh, you buy another full game if you want to restart, so it's a bit different. Um, and uh, the last weekend, we tried uh, another game for the first time in the collection, which I bought, uh, I think, a month, and a, a month and a half ago. But my professional life has been a bit messy, so we didn't get to work. See, so we didn't get to work uh, to, to play it right away. Uh, and I'm just going not to disclose the name of the game, because this will be our second topic today. <laughs> ah, surprise! Spoiler alert! <laughs> So, so we are about to talk about a game that you didn't. <laughs> so, so we are about to talk about a game that you didn't have the chance to try. No, I, I finally had the chance to try it uh, oh. last weekend. Oh. Okay, that's good. <laughs> well, before we jump ahead of ourselves, David, what have you been up to? Uh, my my wife and I we, uh, we are... David, what have you been up to? Uh, my, my wife and I, we, uh, we are close to finishing the first playthrough of Sleeping Gods and we enjoyed it a lot of, so far. I mean, we are going to talk about somewhere in the future episode about that. So, yeah, but it's 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 a lot of fun and it's like our, our like day off and play a game together and it fits that role perfectly. Um, on the other hand, um, I have been busy like organizing or like, yeah, my son will have uh, his fourth birthday on the weekend, so we uh, organized a small party. I don't, he will get a small bicycle for this this week, and I think it will be a lot of fun, especially after like these uh, difficult times to have like a small t come together, have like some of his friends, uh, and over and uh, yeah, meet like some adults as well. <laughs> Sounds very busy. 
<laughs> and uh, I guess, uh, Alessio, you're last to talk about it, and then you can take us into our first topic. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, so, speaking about what I've been doing uh, these days, I actually re received my copy of Spurs End uh, because I got a late pledge that no, the late pledge was late. I actually piggybacked on a friend. The friend uh, sent me a package. The package got lost. I recovered the package. So, actually, I managed to play yesterday night. And I have to say... It's a good, good game. Very simple and elegant. I like it. We, I will probably want to talk about it in a future episode. Now, to go ahead of myself, I was actually caught in a lot of news about expansions of current games. I think 2021 is a good game. Is a good year for expansion of games. Uh, I think 2021 is a good game. Is a good year for expansion of games. Uh, for instance. We have an expansion listed for Beyond the Sun, which is uh, Leaders of the Exodus, which will introduce a solo mod. It, it will fix mass cloning, which is actually, I think, a uh, solo mod. It, it will fix mass cloning, which is actually a thing uh, that people was begging for. And it will add va var more variable player powers in the form of leaders. So uh, that's a cool one. But not just that, there is uh, an expansion scheduled for, for scheduled for Fort, which is Cats and Dogs. And <laughs> besides being extremely thematic, because dogs will be loyal and will play with you, and cats you will have to conquer and that the one by one, I, I think that it's set to fix uh, the, the, the most, uh, the biggest gripe I had with the game. Someone uh, builds the Fort, you always have to... To, to follow suit because uh, if you end up uh, one or two levels behind uh, you are actually bound to lose uh, in the end of the game uh, this adds var variance to this so it's actually very welcome uh, third which is uh, actually due is an expansion to res arcana uh, which is uh, one of my personal favorites lately but uh, mostly it adds the pearls, which is basically white mana, so that uh, the metamorphosis into Magic the Gathering is co will be complete. <laughs> Actually, they but uh, okay, you got the gist. It's uh, waited for this coming October, so uh, actually we will see. It promises to give us uh, uh, use for the Wind Up Man, the, the most des universally despised card in the game. I think to add a bit of dialogue, uh, I think that we could wait for Fen now. No, I said that you would take us straight through. Ah, straight through, okay. <laughs> I'm going this. Uh, uh, okay, I got this. Okay, I got this. Do it! Uh, so, we were talking about the magic world, or actually in the fantasy world, or better, better more, the mythological world of Nidavellir. Uh, what is Nidavellir? Uh, in Norse mythology is the Dwarf Kingdom, so it's uh, one of the, of the kingdoms populated by being and intelligent beings. Uh, the, it's the one with dwarfs, you know the small guys, and uh, there is a game about that, which is a card game, and uh, uh, what's up, what happened? The, the dragon Fafnir come to occupy Nidavellir. The, the nobles of the dwarf uh, of the dwarf families, the Helvalans, uh, to form an army to have the honor to fight the dragon. So you have to collect dwarfs among uh, all uh, taverns in Nidavellir to an army with the uh, biggest courage and the one which has the highest courage rating at the end of the game uh, basically wins and gets the honor to get uh, butchered by the dragon, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is a, a very simple game. It can be played, uh, let's say, 20 to 40 minutes, depending on the number of players. It can accommodate, uh, uh, I think, three to five players, uh, two to five players, actually. And uh, it's played uh, among uh, two eras of four turns each. In uh, each of these 
uh, of these turns, every player bets money on one of three taverns, which are populated uh, randomly with uh, dwarves of different classes. The classes are represented by colors. Uh, they are artisans, scout, uh, uh, orange guys, where well, there are the green guys too. <laughs> and uh, uh, each of these uh, classes have a different way to score. For instance, the, the, the purple uh, class, the artisans, he scores by uh, adding 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 uh, up linearly the number of ranks you get in that class so if you have two dwarves the first is uh, worth three points the second one is worth four points for a total of uh, seven points if you add a dwarf to that you will get five for a total of uh, seven points if you add a dwarf to that you will get five more points and we, you and you will end up to 12 points in that class. You have the green ones, which are the square value of the number of dwarfs of, the, of that color. So if you get three, it's three squared, nine. Square value of the number of dwarfs of, the, of that color. So if you get three, it's three squared, nine points, and so on. You get the scouts, which are the blue one, the azure one and uh, those are just the sum of the value of the courage printed of the cards and you have the warriors which are which are pretty similar but if you have more ranks on warriors uh, than anyone else you get uh, to sum to that value the value of your uh, most valued coin and then there are the orange uh, guys which are minus yeah they are the, the, the trickiest actually because uh, e they they are all valued 0 to 2 with a hero with a single hero uh, which is worth 3 points and uh, the value of that class is given by the sum of the values of the dwarves multiplied by the dwarves in the in the class and so that's it basically everyone beats and uh, the bits uh, are disclosed and then you go and then you go resolving the bits uh, highest to lowest and the first one picks and then twist to this because the the money worth zero the the, the coin worth zero actually allows if you uh, bet it you are allowed to sum the two coins that you haven't bid that round so that uh, your coins will be worth more for uh, uh, you go doing uh, like this when you complete a rank uh, or uh, basically you get one dwarf per color in a line you are able to recruit an hero which gives you well more ranks in a class or special powers and at the end of the first era you get you get a, a midterm scoring uh, where the the one with most ranks in each of the classes gets a themed uh, advantage for the next era and then at the end the scores are compared so this is basically it the kind of a collective game on board game arena so uh, everyone can add uh, their opinion about this so yeah i i enjoyed it a lot it's interesting because it's not only how much you, you bid on the different taverns but it's also like uh there's like some small random fact factor like in the first round you have to see which cards you can get or will probably probably get and then you have a plan to do it or yeah make a plan from there which is like really interesting because on the other side you always want to all those combination of all colors so you get a hero card for free because it can like boost your total points a lot yeah, yeah, th that's actually the interesting part of the base game. Basically, you, you get to decide if you want the base game. Basically, you, you get to decide if you want to go for ranks or if you want to go in depth in a class to get uh, the bonus. Of course, you have to vary among uh, a couple of three classes. And uh, that's basically it. It's a very simple game. The betting part is uh, that's basically it. It's a very simple game. The betting part is actually quite smart, smart because uh, it uh, gives worth to the money that you don't play. 
and uh, that it's actually the smart part of the game the, the, the twist to the because otherwise it would be just a glorified version of medici with uh, randomness thrown in that's something that i completely uh, i would not say forgot uh, but um, overlooked while we played uh, the fact that yeah you can improve your coins and how to play the zero coin so I, I started strong. Oh, the other guys, they're going to improve uh, their value, the value of their coins and then later I won't be able to bid just as much as I might want to. So I need to take care of that. And I think that's something that is, inter is interesting in this game. It, it, it's often the case, but uh, this is the, the mechanics that... And I think we will talk about it uh, with Fen as, as soon as we get to the expansion. Anyway... Um... This game is basically uh, a, a, a great Euro game in disguise because, of course, uh, you have to bid, uh, you have to plan a strategy, enough randomization to not be, to have to adapt. Uh, the, the, the cool part about this game is, of course, that uh, you can plan ahead uh, where, where you want to be with, uh, with your ranks in the end or at least mid-term in the game but of course the the, the bad uh, i have played with people who, who are not uh, comfortable with playing lost cities which is ba basically uh, subtract uh, subtract points to 20 from 20 and then uh, multiply by the contracts you had at start and this game is multiply by the contracts you had at start and this game is actually uh, a bit more complex math so uh, it's a good game to have played uh, in an app or on board game arena because uh, it da it does the math for you app or on board game arena because uh, it da it does the math for you otherwise uh, you have to keep track uh, closely of the scoring otherwise you will f you will fall behind uh, uh, a lot early and you will uh, have a lot of trouble trying to to trying to to get back to get back on track which leads actually us uh, which leads uh, us uh, to the expansion which is think value <laughs> it's called about the Icelandic island I think and uh, it is an expansion which basically game uh, you get uh, you get uh okay uh, you basically get uh, another tavern kind of a tavern you get the highland with a camp of mercenaries which are not like heroes meaning that you can uh, use them to boost the ranks but uh, not the same powers as heroes or magical objects uh, if you are the first to choose you can either pick uh, as usual in the classic nidavali style or you can pick from the camp at the island. Uh, this camp of the game. I, uh, a player uh, used to need a value. We will actually have, uh, uh, have to review their strategy completely. Because uh, depending on what you draw on the camp, uh, whatever you have planned could change completely. So it basically gives you for a more tactical experience in exchange for giving you the chance to recoup your losses when you are behind. So it's uh, basically an exchange in uh, uh, short sighting a bit, uh, uh, short sighting a bit the strategical depth to increase on the tactical side. And that's it. I think Fen has, has opinions on that. And I think uh, Audrey has something to say. Yeah, I do have uh, something. Uh, it's, it's a little bit... Say. Yeah, I do have uh, something. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of trivia about the way the rules are written in the French version, because that's uh, what I read. And uh, that's something that I want to say kudos to the French translation team because uh, in French, it's a language team because uh, in French, it's a language where we don't have a neutral word. We have masculine and the feminine. And uh, many people are working on making what they call an inclusive language, which 
includes together um, f the female and uh, to merge together or to use some uh, words which are neutral whenever possible and the rules of uh, Nida Velia are written in an inclusive language everything and yeah. uh, that's something that I want to upload because uh, as we are more and more female and uh, uh, people in the board game uh, industry and in the board game players it's something that is really great to see that people think about you yeah, uh, uh, yeah. There has been a lot of talk uh, by the end of last year, and uh, it's uh, beautiful to see that actually manufacturers and writers and manual writers are actually uh, acting up to the suggestions from the communities. So uh, I think that uh, uh, basically I will pass judgment here. I like a lot Nida Valier. It's a very strategic game with a lot of depth and allows you to uh, economize and calculate around uh, your game. That's the kind of game with clicks with me. Now, I know for a fact that fans that, that fan is a lover of uh, the game with expansion, which I like a, a bit less because, yes, I appreciate uh, the, the more choices it gives to you, but I don't like a lot that you get short-sighted for that because basically you won't uh, you won't be able to plan for eight turns in advance so that's it i i, I know that fan likes a lot think value so that's it i i, I know that fan likes a lot think value but since he's silent, I guess he's just conceding the argument, so I won. No, it's very difficult to get a word in it. <laughs> and also, I wanted to give Audrey space to speak as well. Uh, Thank you! I, I'm just going to keep it very simple, face to speak as well. Uh, Thank you! I, I'm just going to keep it very simple. Thing Valia is possibly my expansion of 2021. It does everything I want an expansion to do. It adds more leaders. Great. It adds the mercenary camp, which makes going first in bigger groups actually matter, whereas normally eh, first or second's good. First or second's good enough, and maybe you're trying to like sneak your way in at last and upgrade your coins, but suddenly the mercenary camp changes the dynamic. The artifacts amazing. Amazing for like players who are not as experienced to give them some cheaper ways of getting in at le a leader-like ability. And ultimately, it reminds me of um, Bulls vs. Imperium for Race for the Galaxy, which it took the strategies that were in the core game uh, that weren't quite so well fleshed out and just expanded them. It just gave you more options and more choices, which I think is just a good, get, a good thing. Any game should have ways for newer players to not get completely stuffed over if they mess up early on, and also give tricky choices to more experienced players. So it's great. And ultimately, it fits in the main box, so you can toss out the little box with no concern at all, which is just great. You know, I don't want a game with three expansion boxes on the shelf. I want it all in one. Is it true as well if you... So, um, Thing Valir is like just a deck of cards and a few tokens, so it's, it fits in absolutely fine. I've actually still got the expansion box fitted inside the main box because I've not sorted out a proper storage solution yet, so I'm just like, well, I'll just keep it in there. No, even though I always play with... The... Oh, you know what? You're right. You're right, Tom. That's what I'm going to do from now on, and it just helps the new player experience. I, I knew that I could just uh, I could not just win an argument like that. No, you you, you can't <laughs> mic drop on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's actually uh, anyway. Actually, uh, anyway, uh, I actually agree with everything you said because it adds a lot of tactical depth. The the problem I have with that is just uh, that it's tactics. So uh, you just give up the bigger plan to adapt to whatever you find and uh, while I like it plan to adapt to whatever you find and uh, while I like it when it's uh, dudes on a map uh, when it's um, tactical positioning game uh, in a card game when you bet uh, I actually when you bid actually uh, I, I would really when you bid actually uh, I, I would love to to be a bit more farsighted um, I'll, I'll make you an example. Uh, the typical Nidavellir uh, just base game 
I, I play, it's usually around 200 to 300 points. That uh, thing value game ends uh, below the 300 points for each player, basically. Everyone knows bigger scores are more exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but... Yeah, but that means that the, the variation that is added actually trumps the the, the no the, the things that you knew from the base game, and one and it's still uh, uh, a big recommendation because I would actually recommend the expansion. I, I was of another mind a couple of days ago, but uh, since uh, I knew that you were of this opinion, I played a lot of thing very games and I got the gist of it. So uh, I would recommend expansion. I think the strategic part go for the base game only because that's the only part of the game where you could plan start to finish. If you want to adapt to improvise and to overcome odds and to react to other player strategies, uh, think value is the best. I would argue if you want a game where you can strategize from the beginning, the whole point of a card game is things shifting from one moment to the next. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. But, uh, it's, I think we can safely say that um, uh, Nivedalia, Nivedalia, or Nivedalia, or however you want to pronounce it, 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 it has a, actually there's a way you're supposed to pronounce it in, um, in old, but I will be damned if I'm going to be able to pronounce it correctly. But, I, will, uh, I am going to call it Nidavellir. Nivedalia. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, actually in Italian we have Nidavellir. Um, did, did, it, interestingly, in the Marvel movies, Thor mispronounces the name the first time he talks about it. I think he gets the V. And Thor mispronounces the name the first time he talks about it. I think he gets the V and the D the wrong way around. Um, <laughs> which is uh, yeah, it's, but it's, Thor uh, is an idiot. Well, he is an idiot, but he's a big, giant, lovable idiot. Yeah. Indeed. Um, right. Well, we're going to go from a, uh, a indeed. Um, right. Well, we're going to go from a uh, a big bearded man wielding a hammer to um, some small furry critters who might well be wielding hammers at some of their jobs. So, Audrey, would you like to tell us all about our next game? Yes. So our next game, which I teased a bit about uh, in the intro, out uh, in the intro, is going to be Everdell. Uh, I bought Everdell when it came back in the French uh, second edition. Uh, there was a big hype and the day that it opened I went to the store and I said please I want to have Everdell but it's not out on the shelves and I said yes because it's in storage let me get one for you. We have Everdell but it's not out on the shelves and I said yes because it's in storage let me get one for you. We. Um, so Everdell. Everdell is uh, often named as a worker placement game but it's more than that it's a worker placement game yes but your placement game yes but it's also a resource engine building game and it's a tableau builder yes but it's proper name you you have it <laughs> thank yeah, you I, I often I, forget that time. it's my favorite of these worker placement card game hybrid type things but please do carry on uh, end of a year where the wildlife uh, prepares the city for the next winter. Uh, so you're going to take turns. You have the uh, seasons, basically. So you have first, basically it's winter. If I understood the rules correctly, because in French they're a bit confusing. Because it seems that you have to play the winter, then, then get ready for autumn, then play autumn. And then the game ends. And during each season, you will be able to place your workers on different locations on the map to do actions. These actions will be in ultimately able to get resources, points, or that's the basic of the game. When you prepare for a next season, you can score points, you, you can sc score resources mostly, and get more workers for the next season. That's the basic of how the game plays. Now the trick is that Every card can combo in multiple other cards. So the card that you will draw, you may want to discard them to do certain effects or to build them, which will then allow you to build other cards uh, for free or for less resources. And in the end, you will populate your village up to 15 cards with, with buildings and with creatures, mostly. And all the creatures are 
adorable. You have the mouse, you have the owl, you have just everything. The, the game is a work of art and it's not just the cards because the board itself is a wonderful it's not just the cards because the board itself is a wonderful um, grassland with a river and you have just everything designed every place to put uh, every single of your resources and the tree on which you will put uh, the events the draw pile uh, the workers that you will uh, the events the draw pile uh, the workers that you will recruit for each season everything is just wonderful and bright and colored and it's just yeah the forest life in a in a in a ah how do you call that in a ah, how is it called in English? It. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you, you feel a bit like Snow White singing to birds <laughs> at some point. Uh, <laughs> and the meeples. The meeples. <laughs> you have all the little meeple of creatures. You have the hedgehogs. You have the mice. You have the rats. E everything is just so beautiful. I think that's the, that's the world. And so we played a two player's game and I was a bit surprised because the deck of cards is a is a good enough uh, deck of cards and I didn't expect us to draw many cards and in fact we have the, in the game there are so many ways to discard and draw cards the deck of cards and I wouldn't expect that to happen in a two player's game but you really see many cards during the game and I was just marveling every time oh this one is so cute oh the cemetery oh no the cemetery is a bit less cute oh the school oh university oh, everything was just so cute oh the queen oh the queen <laughs> So it it was a bit to eat the wooden <laughs> branches. Uh, <laughs> of course, he stayed nice during the the game. So it no. was a very good experience, and I want to play more because uh, the first game is just scrapping the surface. Yeah, uh, I I actually uh, was drawn to the game table. I think that uh, a, a game uh, which can be compared to be as cool as Everdell when it's played on the table is just Yggdrasil Chronicles or, or the original Yggdrasil, of course. But Yggdrasil Cor Chronicles is just gorgeous with uh, with the tree at the center of the of the table and everything just gorgeous with the uh, with the tree at the center of the of the table and everything on it uh, plays perfectly of course uh, Yggdrasil Chronicles is a pain to play because uh, stuff slips and goes around and you have to, to move around the table Everdell is also fine to play yeah this game like that you have to, to move around the table Everdell is also fine to play yeah this game like it's right up my uh, my tree um because of the fact that it's a card building tableau constructing style game where race for the galaxy is my most played game of all time and in my top three games game of all time and in my top three games um uh, everdell like has some of that the elements that i enjoy so much uh, but my goodness, it is such a spectacle on the table. Every single component is thoughtful and beautiful. Um, I, I've noticed uh, that every single one of the resources, single one of the resources, is made of a different material. So that which is really sweet, like the berries are squishy a berries. soft rubber. Yeah, they're slightly squishy. The pebbles feel like little pebbles that an otter would be very thrilled to secrete away and and play with. Uh, the uh, resin is kind of like an amber color. The wood looks like wood. It's it and, and the meeples. The meeples are some of the cutest and best meeples I've seen in any game. And the biggest shame is that loads of the uh, animal species are Kickstarter only, which just feels Ooh. kind of. I know. Yeah, I, I was actually options because the base game has a kind of a fraction of all the meeples around. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not really kickstarter exclusive the problem and i think uh, i agree the game is great it's it's one of my favorite games it's so beautiful and the core game itself is just a really round experience but i i don't um there are the expansions and for each expansion there is an uh, a collector's edition the same with the core game there is the core game and there's a collector's edition and uh, while the collector's editions aren't uh, sold in retail, basically like package, packages with the 
content for the collector's editions separately. However, the price is insane. Um, so if you buy the retail version plus the package that has the collector's edition contents, you pay a so, so it's really a lot more you have to pay to get everything. And that's, uh, well, that has a bad aftertaste. <laughs> Pearl Brook was on a discount uh, on French Amazon, uh, I think, a few weeks ago. Uh, it was still 20 euros, but it was really the, the collector. Uh, the French community was just crazy with it. <laughs> well, completely crazy. My problem is, for love nor money, I can't get the Ashalots anywhere. Oh no! I cannot. That like, sucks. The, I, I put up a picture of them, yeah, and I have the cardinals and the standard ones and, and everything. But about nearly half of those meeples, but about nearly half of those meeples, I cannot get. Although I will be able to get now because actually I, I backed for the big giant box collectors or everything all in. I'm done. I've got it all. Um, when the Kickstarter was up, and I'll find a new home for my old copy of Everdell when that comes round. Yeah. I, I think a lot of I think a lot of people did like you. J just get everything back in the big box and sell off the stuff while the big box is uh, uh, fulfilling. Oh, so there's going to be a whole load of people looking looking to offload their not quite complete copies of Everdell. Uh, so uh, maybe in the future. Yeah. Anyway, that, that has been criticized a lot. Both the, the money investment required to recoup for the people who was just part of Everdell and the fact that a lot of people is selling, yeah. Yeah. So you did ask about the expansions. I do have all of the expansions, but the trouble is, is everything is what? I know I'm not a big, I don't really interact very much with the Pearl Brook stuff, which is the water-based, um, uh, but the Otter meat Meeples are like some of my favorite Meeples. Um, in the game. What's a Mist Veil then? Uh, That's under the upcoming Mistwood? expansion. Yeah, uh, Mist oh. oh, Spirecrest I like. Spirecrest has the little like mountain board um, where you just kind of like adventure around in it and it's got a whole load of extra uh, cute little animals. Well, they're big actually, big animals that you can find. I haven't had a chance to play with that as much as I would like, but uh, as much as I would like, but uh, um, it is, it fits at the bottom of the board. That's the other thing that's really cool about uh, Everdell is it seems like they've thought very carefully about how everything fits together. And um, uh, so like Pearlbrook fits on the left-hand side of the board and uh, Spycrest fits on the bottom, fits on the bottom. I think if I remember correctly, one of them just kind of replaces the tree, though. Uh, Belfair kind of uh, replaces the tree, but the board fits on the top of the core game board. That that's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's always a nightmare trying to fit it all on the table. It's always a nightmare trying to fit it all on the table to play with. So we we end up just kind of playing often with um, the core game and Spirecrest. Uh, I do have the extra extra as well, I think, and the Glimmer Gold, Glimmer Gold pack. I don't know. I got some packs from Board Game Geek, and they're mixed in. It's going to be fun untangling everything and everything, and figuring out if anything should go in the big box at the end. Mm. Um, I I do want to say uh, I was reading on them uh, uh, on this, and something popped up that I thought was really nice is that um, the company was emailed by someone who was asking, they said, the husband and wife mouse share the yes, same space. Yes, I, re I remember sharing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did, you shared it, that's right, and I thought it was really nice that they were talking about ways of thinking about how to cover for people who might not fit into the traditional husband and wife um, dynamic and and allow them to have an inclusive experience in the board game as well, which was really. Spawn and why can't wives save wives? Exactly. However, I so go on. with the expansions, I have mixed feelings. Um, as I said, yes. the the game is one of my favorite games, and um, the core game feels complete. Uh, but I do see flaws with the expansions more critical um, like with Pearl Brook there is this whole thing with um, you have these uh, cards that lay face down so you don't know what's on them you put your worker there and then you only 
is at this location and maybe you can't do the action because you are missing the resources. And um, that's something that's discussed. It's easily solvable. A lot of people online say, yeah, they just lay down the cards face up so you know what's uh, going on. Um, but that's so uh, you have these new wonders you have to build with resources and pearls you get from the river. Um, however, I did play it solo and there it became very obvious that they are worth too many points. Um, um, they totally change how important things are. Um, they cost a lot of resources, which leads to you building less uh, stuff in your town. Um, and I feel like that takes away from what makes the core game so special. Um, and I feel like that takes away from what makes the core game so special, in a way. Um, yeah. I, I'm inclined to agree with you. I'm not a huge fan of Pearlbrook overall. Uh, how do you feel about Spirecrest and Belfair, though? Mechanically, I love Spirecrest. I find the idea endearing uh, to have... I love Spirecrest. I find the idea endearing uh, to have this rabbit explorer traveling um, over the mountains and encounter the things. And I also like the big critters you get to basically like recruit and uh, use from there on. Um, I absolutely do not like about Spirecrest. Um, it introduces weather. But every single weather in this game is bad. You don't get a card that just says, hey, it's a sunny day. <laughs> or there is a forest fire or whatever, but there is never good weather. So what uh, Audrey said with this feeling like you're a Disney princess and everything is fine and you sing with the birds and whatnot, when you add the Spirecrest expansion, the day is ruined because the weather is bad. <laughs> it's Snow White singing in the rain. <laughs> it's, it's more like animals of farthing wood or watership down. <laughs> I, I have to say, <laughs> I, I have to say actually that the, the fact that you place a worker in a face, on a face down card and you will do, or uh, if the worker we will be able to carry on the action sounds like a felony for the for the working placement games yeah yeah it's pretty it's... not fun as i said that board does not go out on the table very often uh, anyway i have to say at the chance to try the base game uh, the game is lovely the game is lovely. I think that I managed to to play it around the time I managed to play Root. So basically, it just lost the comparison with Calfair in Sart because the, the 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 it just lost the comparison with Calfair in Sart because the the, the 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 woodland creatures in Root are cuter. <laughs> but, it was critter time. Yeah, exactly. It was it was a the the, the year of the critters. Actually, I think it happened when uh, when Ruth won the the, crit, the year of the critters. Actually, I think it happened when uh, when Ruth won all the golden geeks basically. So, yeah, it was the year of the critters. The 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 game is actually a very good worker placement. One of the very few work dedicated worker placement games which make me think there's hope think there's hope for the worker placement genre. Of course there's during Imperium, there's also Lost Ruins of Ar Arnak to a degree, but they are not actually just worker placement, they are hybrids and everyone can do something cool with another mechanic. Uh, as a worker placement, uh, Everdell is very also, one thing that I would want to note is that I have a big enough uh, dining and playing table, which I bought uh, thinking about the Kingdom Death uh, board. And yeah, when I started to lay the board and the cards and for Everdell, and then I saw your city and you will take uh, 15 cards, and I was like, oh, I am not sure I can fit four players on my table. Wow. Yeah, I've got a... Uh, mine's a 220 by 2 meter table with extension leaves to put it up to nearly 3 meters. 
um, that's the downstairs table, and yeah, four meters. Um, that's the downstairs table, and yeah, four players on there with Everdell. It's really hard to just like the main game will fit, but if you want to play with any expansions, it's it gets tough. And then if you, especially if you want to play Spirecrest and uh, Belfair, because it's so it's so long, it just yeah. you have to rotate to rotate it 90 degrees to get it fit on the table, and it looks weird. Luckily, the tree's we not there. So we what? were two with just the base game, so that was okay. But uh, if I have a guest and we want to play, oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> You'll have to give them a little side table that they can keep their city on. We actually, yeah. We actually did that when we played Kingdom. <laughs> I mean, the I first time. I was going to say. I, go on. I, I, the first time I played Everdell, it was on a kind of small table, so the table was just a little bit wider than the uh, board of the Everdell core game and um, it was uh, long as the board and we managed to play with four players. Um, of course you can't like lay out your city in a three by five square uh, neatly and so um, we did have to somewhat, you know, stack cards like, okay, this card has uh, had a one-time effect and now, not and now nothing anymore. So I'll just put it to the side and, um, but it's possible. Yeah, tip, that's not a square if it's three by five. <laughs> rectangle, rectangle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh, it's something that you can do, but then you don't get to say, oh, I don't remember. Yeah, but uh, it's something that you can do, but then you don't get to say, oh, I don't remember which cards do you have so that I can check how many points you are at right now. And so, yeah, you need space. Yeah, I think we actually like like um, took coins uh, for every point we um, took coins uh, for every point we got. So um, we just set the piles then. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just you can't over overstate how expansive and large this game is. Uh, if you do want to lay it out on the board and play it properly, uh, you do want for being organised. I was also going to say, um, uh, when it comes to uh, worker placement games and good ones, um, I uh, roughly on topic. It's about apples. Um, they're in woods. Uh, I really like Newton, um, which is a 2018 worker placement game about uh, being a young scientist. Trying to, we're going to review it in full, I think. But uh, I, I, if you enjoy worker placement games and you're interested in science, it's definitely worth a look, and it has a great solo game. I had another thought about the space of the game. The tree, which makes a few things vertical, doesn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of, of course, of course, it's Heck pretty. It's pretty. But you're supposed to put the future meeples uh, on top of the tree. You could just put them anywhere, literally. Yeah. And the event cards, if you didn't have the tree, you could put them just where the tree is, and the pile of cards would still be there. It's not, it's not a problem. So it's just, and the pile of cards would still be there. It's not, it's not a problem. So it's just cute. In fact, with the event cards, the tree is actually like problematic because they are more difficult to read. Uh, when they lie on top of a tree than when they lie on the board. Um, so as long as you don't have like little stand um, so as long as you don't have like little standees for for the cards. Yeah. And when you do have standees they uh, fall off. At times if you knock the same little all the cards take a dive, which is fun. Um I mean, obviously, the woodland folk came to the same conclusion as us because by the time the woodland folk came to the same conclusion as us because by the time Belfair comes around, they've already chopped that tree down and got rid of it. <laughs> no, they, the, 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 the the fair is behind the tree. They don't chop uh, down the tree. I don't see the tree on that map. Oh, I it's, guess maybe it's, there it is vaguely. It's it's yeah. it's just not pictured. Uh, no, no, yeah. It's just not pictured. Uh, no, no, look, for, there's a chopped down for... tree there, right on the board. <laughs> there's this there's the stamp <laughs> they certainly felt something for that there that's for sure something broke inside of me right now oh no the industrial <laughs> oh no the industrial revolution took place inside of everdale <laughs> the, the tree didn't survive the war building 
And as a last notice, I will say that uh, at some point I will want the authors. Yeah, they um, really pretty. This this game very much makes me uh, hope that one day we get a, a good Red Wall game. I mean, we're going to get some Red Wall games coming with Netflix uh, going to be doing a series, which I imagine they'll do for two seasons and then cancel it because that's what Netflix does. Um, but I look forward. I look cute, cute little forest uh, to a world where forests are mostly chopped down and pushed into the fires of indus industry. So, Cara, would you like to uh, take us on a wonderful journey through an alternate history? Yeah, sure. Actually, I have a poster here um, that uh, encourage me, encourages me to see your recruitment office. Um, so we are talking about Scythe, a game which uh, keeps Germans baffled on how to pronounce it for some reason. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> can confirm. <laughs> I had so many discussions. How it's called? Saif? Suf? Saif? Um, Imagine! Well, and what is it in Italian? Go on, we must get the full set. <laughs> we, we call it Saif. Oh, boring. Get, yeah. get your own boring language. Also, <laughs> at, at least I, I, I wanted it to be beeped like Audrey yet again, Audrey. Sit. Language, lady. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's like uh, the um, a seat like in, in Star Wars, in French, you would say it the same way. Well, anyway, so it's a um, well-known game by Jamie uh, Stackmeyer um, from 2006. Well-known game by Jamie uh, Stackmeyer um, from 2016, uh, published by Stonemeyer Games originally. And um, yeah, it's a area control engine building game, I think. I have to admit, I'm not very well with these gaming categories. Engine building game, I think. I have to admit, I'm not very well with these gaming categories. Um, it's... Um, Dudes on a map. Well, no, it isn't. It, it, it was originally pitched as a 4X game cut down to play within a two hour frame. But uh, it's kind of okay. <laughs> yeah, I'd say I'd say economic engine plus do on a map. That's that's fitting, I think. So um, yeah, it plays in the 1920s Europe, uh, a slightly alternate timeline. Um, we have giant. <clears throat> it's uh, I think it's called Diesel Punk. Yep. And um, different uh, factions fight over um, a piece of land where a giant factory from uh, Tesla is located um, uh, to his uh, new inventions, uh, which could uh, completely change the dynamics of power between nations. And um, yeah, so uh, players uh, take turns um, activating um, parts of operation board. Uh, each part has like a top action, the bottom action, and um, move around farmers and mechs and collect resources, uh, build up their engine, build new mechs, and sometimes even fight. It's altogether pretty much randomness in the game, and um, which is for some people, great. I really like that. Others think it's too boring. But um, yeah. Yeah, I think um, Scythe does a very good job. I think it's too boring. But um, yeah. Yeah, I think um, Scythe does a very good job of creating, well, world building but also um, creating a game where you're very um, Scythe does a very good job of creating, well, world building, but also um, creating a game where you're very incrementally gaining things. And every decision is quite sort of difficult. Each start location has some fairly tough decisions, tough decisions on what you're going to do, because inevitably you've got to cross a river. Across a river, you usually need a mech in order to be able to uh, river walk. Um, and it's 
it's a very fascinating game to play. I find skill um, and experience. It's also got some very odd things like uh, the achievement system, which I like and I don't like. I like that you get a little star every time you do an achievement and you feel like, woo! <laughs> uh, then it's like, does it score you points? Kind of. Is it important points? Not really. Not really. No. <laughs> be fighting because the peasants get very upset about that, and your popularity drops, and then everything else is worth less points. And that's the thing I love most at all about this. I love a game which is economic with a spice of warfare. I, I really enjoy not the actual combat. I enjoy the Cold War and the stalemate and the maneuvering and the talking about, look, I don't really want to fight you because if I fight you, then this person over here is going to come in and vulture one of us and probably run away with this. But I need that space. So what can we do to sort this out? And the, the addition of popularity, I think, is, is so great. Uh, civilians don't like wars. And if you're going to be a horror they they get upset about it. And it makes me happy to play this game compared to some um I, i've got a couple of friends back in the uk who it ended up i refused to sit next to them if we were playing any kind of game which was an economic point scoring game with war in it so if it was um the twilight imperium was the game with war in it so if it was um the Twilight Imperium is the classic because you could be involved in a long protracted diplomatic stalemate with somebody else um, and then they would look and because neither of you rolling dice, they'd decide, oh, no one's having fun. No one's doing anything. Let's get in and rumble. And they just charge at something of yours, <laughs> somebody else. Um, and then they would look and because neither of you rolling dice, they'd decide, oh, no one's having fun. No one's doing anything. Let's get in and rumble. And they just charge at something of yours. <laughs> and next thing you you've collapsed or the your um or, or you're the person you're playing against has collapsed and the whole interesting stalemate that you were trying to work through is just been knocked you you've collapsed or the your um or, or you're the person you're playing against has collapsed and the whole interesting stalemate that you were trying to work through is just being knocked down by a third party because they feel that if people aren't involved in war then there's no fun going on i think i've told the story of one of them which is jim uh, I'll tell it again, just in case I haven't. War game, if there's an option for war, because he's going to fight a fight. We played an eight game of Twilight Imperium um, quite a few years ago. Uh, it took us like a whole weekend to play through. Um, and Jim was battling seven other players through it. Because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> game's game of Thrones game completely eradicated <laughs> from the map because he he attacked me when i was in the middle of a two-way like trying to di diplomatically sort stuff out and exchange of hostages and while he was fighting th war on three fronts anyway he decided to attack me and i was like I i'm done jim i'm really not tolerating this and have some fun i'm gonna leave now i was like no you're not leaving i knocked his army over and then eradicated it and at the same time multiple people did all the other stuff he had a boat left and uh uh, you you lose the game if you have a boat and nothing else. So uh, <laughs> that became our policy against warmongers like that. But we've never had this problem with Scythe because Bloody Track makes you think every time you're going to have a fight, you've got to look at it and weigh it up and be like, is this going to be a popular war? No. Is it worth the points to me? And I think that is so interesting. Yes, yep. definitely. I think, uh, I don't remember the faction name. I think the, the Prussians... The, the Prussians which have like this which have like this option for uh, like more warfare stuff but otherwise it's like uh, yeah war is co costs you a lot like not only in resources but be but also because you have to build up power before you actually go to war and when you go, but also because you have to build up power before you actually go to war and when you go to war you have to be yeah you will drop in popularity, which will cost you points, which is good. Yeah, I have I have to say one good thing and one bad thing about uh, base scythe. Uh, the good thing is that thing and one bad thing about uh, base scythe. Uh, the good thing is that the game is basically a perfect engine. Uh, you start with a selection of actions and you won't be able to perform bottom actions basically because everything is locked everywhere you craft something or you move something or you move something or you uh, achieve something uh, you you basically unlock more option in another track and that's that, that 
it's fulfilling and that it's uh, uh, an extreme satisfaction to play uh, and it's super cool and uh, it, the bad thing about uh, base scythe is it, it is true that it requires a lot of skill and a lot of thinking and everything else but uh, it, it, it's balanced uh, almost to perfection i say almost because uh, uh, jamie basically went safe route to balance factions he, he basically set four core rules and then allowed each of the factions to uh, to uh, ignore one of the rules it happens that at the same level of skills invariantly at least in my groups there has this win because the the rule they're going to ignore is the best one uh, they can take double actions they can ta take uh, the same action two times in a row uh, in two different turns and that is uh, more powerful than anything because double move at the beginning of all way more powerful you have uh, to struggle just to be on par with them but uh, like there was like a like perfect um like perfect solution like uh, the rasviets had the option to do like a certain uh like uh, actions they could take and it was pretty much impossible to counter the uh, ratas yeah uh, yeah it actually i i keep hearing good things about uh, how rise of fairies uh, basically gave everything a new perspective uh for the core part not a lot airships do a bit to fix that but they so well for me airships is i think the wind gambit is the weakest of all of the expansions uh, yeah, i found absolutely. actually invaders invaders from afar the um, togawa although my goodness the traps can be really frustrating and a borderline like ridiculous they are very good i believe they are located near them to start with although i wouldn't know because i'm on the other side of the borders albion <laughs> yeah actually actually th that happens only if you can fill a table anyway yeah well uh, if you can't fill a table in scythe what are you doing i got four decks for yeah the i got four of, what are you doing i got four decks for yeah the i got four atoma decks you know automata decks um <laughs> yeah i i yes i think we you did mention it briefly and we we're going to talk about it is the rise of fenris um which yeah. i think is a wonderful expansion uh, it's very interesting how it it's essentially this big pile of modules it's very interesting how it it's essentially this big pile of modular things that you add to the game and take away to change the experience to hopefully deal with problems you might be experiencing in your meta but it's presented in this gradual unfolding campaign that trots a new bit out every time and has you open the boxes and go ooh um, in the classic legacy kind of way, but it's it's not really a legacy. It's more of hey, we're adding new stuff to the game. Um, you can learn it as you go along. Yeah, it's like that's really a fantastic idea. Like it's not it fixes like some parts of the weakness of the base game, and at the same time has like this campaign mode, which is this game, and at the same time has like this campaign mode, which expands like the lore and everything behind and what's going on in Scythe. So that's like pretty much one of my favorite expansions ever. Yeah, for me too. I, I played it solo and um, it was really fun. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not really fun. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not like a big uh, epic campaign. It's like eight missions or so. Um, so basically like you play eight consecutive games of Scythe with different uh, setups and story behind it and as a fan said, like you unlock along the way. And um, I think at two points you uh, can make a decision which uh, changes like the direction of the campaign. Um, but I really liked the story and I um, really liked how it added to the whole Scythe experience. Um, so I definitely recommend to get this one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was going to say um, they, that expansion has my favorite mechs in in the entire game, like for the look of them. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say which ones, but they're just fantastic. Yeah. Well, um, I think do we have anything? Yeah. Well, um, I think do we have anything more we'd like to say about Scythe, or would we like to talk about something that's tangential to Scythe briefly? Yes, I do. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, 
Safe has a good thing for people with children. It has an alternative game adapted for people with children. It has an alternative game adapted for children. My little Safe with cute miniatures of animals. We are back to cute animals again! Yes! <laughs> well, should we have oh, a oh, leave do, them? Do, them? Do, do you want us to celebrate? I'm celebrating. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> it's just, and it's, it's the same, there are more expansions with more cute minis of animals. Yeah, it's it's really it's it's Hatsa! so lovely this this game. Um, <laughs> a f f cute version of it. Yeah, I think I, I think what sums it up best is you fight for friendship and cake. That's what it is about. Um, <laughs> I mean, the popularity track from Scythe becomes the friendship track. Uh, what's it called in Scythe? Like the uh, military power track becomes the cake track or the pie track. And um, fights are pie fights. So <laughs> you throw pies at each other. It's, it's, I love it. <laughs> Bless oh you. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Which we can. We, which we can ho just hope uh, not being as our words. One of the expansions <laughs> is Pie in the Sky. That's wonderful. <laughs> I, I had an interesting uh, discussion about it because I have both games. And a friend of mine said he would never get a game like this because when he wants to play such a game, he just plays Scythe. Um, and while I can understand this point of view that, yeah, My Little Scythe is like the children version of Scythe. Um, first of all, it's, the, theme, it's, the theme is completely different and it's, it's so cute and, and lovely and, and carrying around apples and uh, gems instead of oil and wood. It's, it's, it's just great. And um, the other thing is, it's not just for children. Um, the other thing is, it's not just for children. Good. It's also for when you have people over who might be interested in a game like Scythe, but aren't into very complex games. And I played My Little Scythe with my mother and uh, games. And I played My Little Scythe with my mother and. Um, she likes the occasional board game, but with My Little Scythe, we played one round and then she said, hey, want to play another round? So she got really into it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. These miniatures are super cute as well. They've got a nice um, three head high style, but it's not really chibi. It's something a little bit different. It's, it's gorgeous. Super and deformed. <laughs> yes, that's the one. Super deformed, yeah. And fun fact, um, inside the leader has always a pet with them. Like, uh, I think the Rusviet leader has a bear and, and so on. So everyone has a pet. And the pets are basically like the animals from My Little Scythe. I think even the colors fit. Like, uh, I think the Rusviets are, are red. I think the red uh, faction in... Uh, my little scythe are bears. So that's that's a fun feature detail. <laughs> yeah, I was just looking at the looking at the models now. Yeah, the uh the yellow faction, the um is it the Crimean uh, I wanna remember the name, the Crimean Carnate. That's that's them. Yep. Oh well that's really cool. I've completely forgotten that my little scythe existed. And I'm very, uh, I'm very excited about that. Actually, it's <laughs> quite well priced, also, which is good. Although I've correct myself, it's uh... yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have said that w that they were German, but I don't want to piss you off. No, oh, it's it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Sax Saxony, yeah, yeah, and the um, there's the Nordic kingdoms, the Republic of Polania. And uh, yeah, the Saxony Empire and the Rus and uh, yeah, the Saxony Empire and the Rusviet Rusviet. Jeez, <laughs> only just finally clicked what they've done with that. Oh, mm. yeah. 
really really nicely done game and uh yeah who'd have thought that this would have ever come into existence uh, yeah who'd have thought that this would have ever come into existence my little scythe it's just wonderful what happens when you let people iterate upon designs honestly i would be more likely to buy my little scythe than uh scythe uh just because uh if you look at my uh, board game shelf, most of the games that I have are colorful and uh, stuff like that. I, I have troubles with games which are which have, a, I would say, blank visual identi identity. I'm not sure if that really fits, but for instance, Brass Birmingham, which we talked a few episodes back, uh, it's not something that I would buy. I, I enjoyed it, but it's not it's not a, a visual theme that talks to me. And sometimes board gamers are really attracted to a visual theme or another and that's where having both is interesting even though the complexity is different yeah and look at that bear's little hat <laughs> yeah well the rest of it is a uh, a, a tiger yeah i just yeah. just noticed the bear is from the right it's, uh, it's the albion the bears i think no it's yeah. not an albion no, no the boar is albion the boar is albion yeah the Bear is oh jeez. Polania. Um, I, yes, yeah. Bear is oh jeez. Polania. Um, I, yes, yes. The 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 po the pseudo Polish. Yeah. Well, um, I think we we could talk about these little models that people can't see for uh, a fair amount of time, but uh, I think that's where where all the time we have, all the time we have. Uh, so you can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last Andy or as the last Andy on Twitter. Uh, so until next time, we have been the last Andy, and it's goodbye from Alessio. Hi, bye, bye. Oh. Uh, David. Cheers. And myself. And remember that the E's in Standy stand for Engine and Escalop. <laughs> <laughs> Escalop? Yeah, I've been talking about animals the whole time, and I wanted to put stale in somewhere. Bison up if you want to eat it. No! Oh.